Talk 1580. When we come forward, we're bringing everybody with us. Happy anniversary, KBLA! First things first. First is the DU General Money P. I'ma put you up on the schedule. Six to nine, eight weekdays, not to a seven years ago. We got a lot to talk about, so much to pedal through. Unapologetically progressive. Tune to KPLA 1580 to get the mess. we your ancestors' favorite radio station. First black on talk radio, left side of the nation. First. Me and Dominique the Prima go way back. Tap smiley, making sure the station stays black. Discussing all the issues in our community. We're host of black and brown and others find unity. So let's talk about it. Maybe we can improve it. Digital underground, always down with the moon. Come on. So we tune in. The first things first with the queen of black talk radio. Dominique to Prima. Go, sis. Go, sis. Go, sis. First KBLA Talk 1580. Good morning and God bless. I'm Dominique DePrima. This show is First Things First. My first thing every day, giving thanks, giving praises, asking for blessings from God, asking for the blessings of the ancestors, the elders, and yes, the community. And let's go. We got a lot to talk about today. Hour one, we look local, left coast, what's going on in your neighborhood. Hour two, we go national, international, and beyond. In the third hour, we do a deep dive with a person or persons of interest and uh, we have some very interesting news from the community in Hour 3 today. Plus, we are joined right now in studio, live on YouTube at KBLA 1580 by the council member for the 8th District, a longtime community advocate and, uh, and the sort of creative vision behind Destination Crenshaw right next door. Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. Good, good morning. morning, Dominique, and good morning to the KBLA family. It's good to be here, bright and early. Yeah, and live if you, and direct. If as you they tune say. in on YouTube, you'll see that he's wearing his Morehouse shirt. Yes, yes. Morehouse Maroon. Yes, yes. Yeah. I uh, have on the hoodie this morning. Uh, <laughs> it's comfortable. I can't wear it to City Hall, so I try to get it in where it fits in. Right, but I mean, also you are another, yet another successful elected who's coming out of an HBCU. Yes, right? uh, the HBCU movement I think is very important uh, and we celebrate it every year. We're eager to get back to it uh, post-pandemic, but we celebrate the HBCUs. You would be shocked, Dominique and listeners. We do a day where we ask everybody who works in any city department who's an HBCU graduate or attendee to come to City Hall and wear your, you know, wear your sweatshirt and wear your colors from your school. And it's hundreds of people. Like, it's wow. people running the airport, people at the fire department, people in the water system. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> people like, in the White House. <laughs> like, no, I mean, it's yeah, really yeah. amazing how much the HBCU system... S- um, contributes to a place like Los Angeles that's far away from any HBCU, actually. That's a great point because we are not, we don't even have one officially. I mean, we right. do have Drew, but CDU, We do have Drew, yeah, yeah but we, we, we have Drew, but we don't have the historic ones. And, you know, we don't have the, the, the California's history with apartheid is a little bit different than the, the southern states uh, and northeastern states where they have these schools. But, you know, I mean, the former council president, Herb Weston is HBCU graduate, members of the Assembly, members of the State Senate, uh, just all around. It it really is amazing. I mean, when you think about, and and I know I'm not here to talk about HBCUs, but when you think about, just take doctors, right? Yeah. Black doctors. Which we have such a huge shortage of. We have such a huge shortage of, but of the doctors there are, do you know half of them, 50%? Graduated from HBCUs. I did not know that. Half. That's crazy. I, I, yeah, I've learned so much just from the CDU, you know, the mm-hmm. the emergence of their medical yeah. school, how much that is needed What's to needed? produce black doctors. And and, and um, even CDU is particular, so Charles Drew University in Watts. Well, even if you look at Latino doctors in L.A. County, doctors who speak Spanish or have Spanish as a first language— 
CDU produces a disproportionate share of those folks. And it's just one little school. Yeah. That's... It just shows you if you put your mind to doing something in it and your values are around it, you can get it done. Right. And it also shows you that when black people and Latina people have the opportunity, yeah. they will yeah. do the job. Yeah, you right? do the do the job. And I and, and anybody, if you're thinking about sending your grandchild or your child to school or you're a young person thinking about school, here's, a, here's the difference with black schools. And I experienced this at Morehouse. The school's not successful unless you are, mm. which means everything is organized around you being successful. I go to UCLA. UCLA is going to be all right whether I pass or right. fail. You <laughs> fall, they got another yeah, guy they fall, waiting. There's waiting somebody to waiting to, take to replace place. me. And happy that right. and, you and, fell, and happy so that I take your place. And yeah. so it's just a different. And again, it's not to say they're not good people at these schools, but it's just when the whole thing is organized for your success, your chances of being successful go way, way up. Yeah. When your sense. success is inconsequential to the institution, uh, you know, the failure rate goes up. That's wild. Uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it. And I'm going to have to make my son listen to this show. <laughs> <laughs> That's another conversation yeah. for another day. So um, uh, we got a lot going on and, and, one of the things I like to talk about what's good first mm -hmm, thing in mm -hmm. the morning because yeah. we need a little encouragement. Yeah. And the, the grant program that you're doing yeah. uh, through CD8 is one of those things that's good, that's encouraging, that folks don't know about. So let's talk about the basis of it, and then we'll get into the specifics yeah. so, when we come forward. So I, I'll start, I'll try to give the big picture. You know, in 2020, um, the we uh, there was a national movement, international movement really around white supremacy more broadly, but police interactions more specifically. Right. Because of the loss of, of, of George Floyd. And, and folks have been doing police work, you know, from forever. Uh, you know, our mayor started off doing police abuse work before I was born. So that work has been going on for a while. Then the Black Lives Matter movement started and that ratcheted it up. And then the George Floyd thing just blew the doors off. So you see things all over the place. One of the things that happens is we finally are to a place where people have figured out you cannot police your way. You can't threaten your way. You can't uh, coerce your way into a peaceful society. You have to do it in a variety of ways and people's basic needs have to be met. So one of the things that we did in L.A. Uh, in 2020 was we said, okay, we looked at the police department and we said, that's almost half the money in the city. There's got to be some loose change over there that we can reinvest in community programs and in things that create safety that aren't policing. And uh, we looked and I think the number was somewhere in the range between 150 million and 2 million. It got divided up. We did some programs that the mayor Garcetti did a bunch of youth hiring. There are other programs. But one of the things they did is they took a certain amount of money and they just doled it out to districts. And they said, in your district, in your community, you just fund stuff that you think contributes to safety. And uh, we'll see what happens. And so in District 8, uh, we got several million dollars. Four million of it we granted to just small community organizations with budgets under five million dollars, less mm. than five million dollars. And we tried to seek out folks who were doing good work on the ground who wouldn't otherwise qualify for a city grant. Because, you know, you got to have insurance and bonding. Yeah. You know, so a big organization like Brotherhood Crusader Community Coalition, they can play in that space. But, you know, the, the you know family on the corner or the group of guys on the corner that's teaching kids karate after school, right. they, they don't have time for all that. So <laughs> those are the groups that we were looking for. And uh, through that program, we, we just are finished our first year and our first cycle of it. And we're just very excited about some of the things that have happened, whether it's, you know, folks that just provide food and a place for folks to commune. I mean, it, it's amazing the people who are dependent on others for things like groceries. Right. Yeah. Uh, and as opposed to having to cross town, which costs money and time to go to a food bank, we have a lot of groups, you know, probably a half dozen that do that on a local basis. So in Hyde Park, there's somebody who does the grocery services. And and in Broadway, Manchester, there's somebody who does grocery services. And in Lemert Park, there's someone who does grocery services. So we're able to fund all of that work, and we're very excited about what is produced. Yeah, we're going to meet some of those folks, of course, um, talk about a few other things happening on the ground. And if you have some conversation, 800-920-1580. Uh, it's about engagement and reciprocity. This is KBLA Talk 1580, where we're amplifying black and progressive voices every day. More of First Things First with Dominique DePrima when we come forward. Have you faced discrimination in Los Angeles? 
the City of L.A. Civil Rights Department can help. They investigate private sector discrimination in L.A. City in commerce, education, employment, and housing. If you're facing discrimination, submit a complaint online for free at laisforeveryone.com. That's laisforeveryone.com. Or call 213-978-1845. Fantasia with special guest Joe Friday May 26th at Microsoft Theater in Los Angeles and Saturday May 27th at Toyota Arena in Ontario Fantasia live in concert tickets on sale now at FantasiaOfficial.com don't miss Fantasia with special guest Joe at Lowe's, we're always bringing pros more ways to save. Right now, get a DeWalt cordless impact driver for just $99. Was $159. That's a savings of $60. Plus, you'll always save big on job lot quantities when buying select building supplies in bulk. Lowe's knows savings. Lowe's knows pros. Selection varies by location while supplies last. Discount taken at time of purchase. See associate for details. Bow through A2. Lowe's reserves the right to limit quantities. Carrie, is this schedule the most updated? There's a wedding season rush at Dr. Iona's dental practice. We're fully booked this week. We can try and squeeze you in next Tuesday. She needs How a dental hygienist to unveil Tuesday. fresh smiles. <gasps> How long has three been under the UV light? Indeed can help her hire great people fast. I need Indeed. Indeed you do. We instantly connect you with quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description. Visit indeed.com slash credit and get $75 towards your first sponsored job. Terms and conditions apply. KBLA Talk 1580 is in the lab right now, prepping some new shows coming your way soon. More empowerment, more inspiration, more entertainment. More entertainment. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Jazz Urban Hour. I'm your host, Bill Banfield. We are a curated musical show that highlights contemporary cultural issues and artistry, showcasing music as a relevant and necessary arm of contemporary cultural identity. You must learn. Welcome. I am your host, Dr. Tyrone Howard on KBLA Talk 1580, and you're listening to You Must Learn, where we talk about education as a tool for transformation, education in our homes, in our schools, and in our communities. Education for Transformation is the tagline, and we are here to talk about why we must learn. KBLA Talk 1580 is for discerning listeners just like you. So tell all your friends you've discovered the talk station curating smart content for smart people. We're KBLA Talk 1580, and we've got you black. Got you black. We've got a lot to talk about. Are you interested in catching up on all the latest entertainment news, trending topics, and exciting interviews? I got you. Tune in to The Raw Report with Robin Ayers, Monday through Friday, 6 to 7 p.m. I'm your host, Robin Ayers. Join me every weekday with some of the best entertainment contributors in the business as we break down what's going on, who's got next, and what not to miss. Only on The Raw Report with Robin Ayers. Unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got your black. Your ancestors' favorite radio station. Radio station. And your favorite morning show host. Let's get back to Dominique DePrima right now. Right now. Actually, we're getting back to Dominique DePrima and council member Marquise Harris Dawson. And um, I, I love this this story because i remember you know when they reallocated some la yeah, yeah. city council dollars and we we don't always find out where these dollars yes go. that's right and over the years i've seen so many tiny micro community-based organizations mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. are just you know they're operating off car wash fundraisers that's right and stuff. that's right that's totally right that's and totally right. so let's talk about uh, some of these organizations and and what you know what the impact has been of this of this funding well, you know, the impact has been that the this funding can help get to places that the government tr traditionally has trouble getting to. And so, you know, we had three organizations. Everybody knows who Su Susan Burton is now. She's, you know, real famous time person of the year, right. all the rest. Well, I remember when Susan Burton started. Susan Burton was a, a black woman who had gotten out of prison and saw how hard it was, had come into control of apartment buildings. Says, you know what, I'm going to open up this apartment building so women coming home from prison have a place to go. And, you know, we'll get counselors to come here. We'll get people to take care of your kids. 
Well, it turns out there's a network of about a dozen organizations that do that now. And again, they do it under the radar. Very similar stories where, you know, they had a, a close friend go to prison, a relative go to prison, or they went to prison themselves. They somehow got control of buildings and they're, they've opened them up to do housing. You now have young black women who've actually done ground up construction. Wow. Of apartment buildings That's in the amazing. community, in the community, specifically to house women getting out of prison. And so we were able to fund some of those groups. One of the groups I'm, I'm most excited about is, you know, all of my life, at least. And I think probably everybody listening, maybe somebody can call in and tell me when it was different. All my life, there's been open, uh, just brazen sex trafficking on Frank Figueroa. Yeah. Every day, nonstop, you know, wall to wall. There are two women's groups that we fund. One is called Sister Friends uh, that we were able to fund. That is just black women who said, you know what? We're just going to go talk to these women. And we're just, you know, we're going to give them our cell phone numbers. We're going to take care packages. We're going to take hygiene equipment. And we just want to be a resource to them. And we want to be the people that when they wake up or when something happens and they decide, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, we want to be the people that they call. Wow, that's that's dope. That's all they do. And so they just go out every morning. They, you know, they're like, we put on a hoodie and sweatpants and, you know, we fill up our trunk with, uh, you know, uh, makeup and hygiene equipment and whatever. And we just work. And, you know, they like we got special cell phones so we can call. And, you know, in the in the meeting where we were discussing their grant, they were actually able to play us voicemails at, you know, three in the morning saying, I got to get off the street. Uh, can you help me? Can somebody help me? Can somebody come get me? All the rest of it. And so not only were we able to fund that organization, but we were able to hook that organization up with other organizations. So now when someone calls them and says, I want to get off the street, what happens is they have another organization where they can call and get that woman an apartment or a hotel room somewhere away from the community where they've uh, experienced so much trauma. And so, it, you know, that kind of work is exciting. That's the kind of work that contributes to public safety that police can never do. A man in a, with a gun and a badge yeah, can never comes, do that, that work. Rolls like that's up on a young woman yeah, on figure yeah. out. No, that you just it. make it worse, frankly. Yeah. Um, because you know you 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 can't uh, arrest somebody for walking up and down the street and appropriately clothed or disclosed, <laughs> depending on how it goes. Uh, but these women working directly with other women can get stuff done. Right. So that that's an organization. That's a, a an example of an organization mm -hmm. that. Um, that probably wouldn't have gotten yeah. any support. Right, and that's public safety. That right. that's the point that I want people to understand. Like it, th there's there are ways to spend public money, your tax dollars, in a way that actually makes a tangible difference in your safety. Well, and I'm thinking about the the other alternative, right? Let's say a, an officer comes up and arrests that person, possibly child, mm -hmm. on Figueroa, and then what happens? They're right. going to go right back right. out to Figueroa. They, yeah. The, the, it's, it's, it's interesting because these women talked about that. They were like, yeah, sometimes we're there and the police will do a sweep and we follow the police to the station. And literally we sit in the lobby. We see them walk them through. We sit there for an hour or so and they walk right back out. And they was like, they don't have any counseling. They don't have anywhere to go. They don't, whatever trauma got them to be in the streets in the first place is not dealt with at all. At all. And so they, they return right to the same place. Or you have the police, you know, playing cops and robber, chasing people up and down right. Figueroa Boulevard, which is dangerous for everybody. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, that's how you have car accidents. And, all. and again, even once they catch them, it doesn't solve the problem. Right. What it does is it levies a punishment. Right. Um We've got um, a couple folks that you're working with on, on the phone. Oh, great. Uh, Yolanda Washington is on, and she's with Sister Friends, which oh, we were just cool. talking about. I was just talking about you Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dominique DeFrima, and good morning, Councilman Marquise Harris Dawson. It's good to hear you. Thank yeah. you. It's great to hear you, and thank you for that wonderful overview. Yeah, so, I mean, talk to me about this this grant. How did it work for you? How did you even hear about it? How did it work for you? And what, what kind of a impact do you think it will make? Oh, excellent. Thank you, Dominique. Well, you know, we heard about this grant through one of the active community members who attends the neighborhood council meetings and is very involved in the community. And she gave me a call and said, you know, Yolanda, given the work that you're doing, I, I think this would be a great opportunity for you to apply. 
So um, we did that, and when we applied, what's great about the councilman is that he also provided technical support uh, for those who were applying to make sure that we uh, shaped our project and proposal in a way that, that, that made sense and that the evaluators can see um, what we were attempting to do. So uh, in this work, it's called Project She, Sisters Help End Exploitation. You know, our, our goal uh, primarily is just to engage these women on the street. When we initially started with zero funding, we were coming out of our pockets, we were only serving maybe about five to ten women per day. But when we were funded with the Reimagine grant, Dominique, we were able to outreach to 25 to 30 women per day. Now we're up to 50. And really what's, what's been really interesting about it is that you know, now the women recognize our truck <laughs> mm. when we come. So they, they they run to us, you know, and, you know, we call them by name because we take down descriptions about who they look like. And, you know, because we're meeting so many uh, per day. And we just engage them, talk about how they're doing, you know, find out what they need, you know, reiterate that we're here for them. And as a result of this funding, um, we were able to assist at least 10 women to flee from sex trafficking, you know. Wow, and we that's are pretty major. It was 10 our, lives. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, it's 10 lives, and what you learn when you do this work is the majority of those women actually have children. It's in many cases that they still have custody of. Mm. So it's more than just the 10 lives. It's 10 yeah. families. Right, yeah, that's a great point. So um, do you feel like, I mean, and this is for both um, Yolanda Washington and Council Member Marquise Harris-Dawson. Do you feel like this, we'll start with you, Yolanda, does it open the door to you maybe looking at other kinds of funding and grants? I mean, I think a lot of times it's intimidating, yeah. you know, especially without that technical assistance. Like, oh, I don't know what to write. Like, we just yeah. do the work. Yeah. Do you think it could open the door in future for you guys uh, doing more grant applications and finding more more funding? That is our hope, Dominique. One of the challenges in, in doing this work is that when you're writing for grant funding, one of the first things you're wanting to ask is what, what data do you have? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. how can you Metrics, demonstrate right. the efficacy and the effectiveness of, of what you're doing? So, so that's one of the roadblocks that we, we reach. Also, as the councilman said, you know, they require, you know, years of audits and, you know, <laughs> letters of uh, recommendation from various grant funders to demonstrate your financial and fisc uh, fiscal abilities to, to manage the fu these funds. And when you don't have a, a, a huge grant uh, tracking record, it, it, you know, it creates a barrier. Also, commercial sex trafficking isn't necessarily viewed as a priority funding um, um, opportunity. Uh, uh, find, uh, which, is, which is crazy uh, because we funding. hear so much talk right. about human trafficking um, and, and, and um, the welfare of you know young people. Yeah, well, when people talk about human trafficking, they're not talking about black people. Right. Like, just be straight to it. Like they they are talking about people being brought from other countries. They're talking about everybody except for black. Well, they're women. talking. They're yeah. talking about it's the same kind of like the missing girl syndrome. Exactly. It's, it's, it is exactly like that. When they, we're missing, even, nobody cares. Right. I, I right. mean, in fact, when you say trafficking, people don't even think of that. Think of what happens on Figaro, even though that's been the most persistent uh, and and most deadly trafficking that we see. Right. Because there's no. 14 year old in the world that's just going to say hey i'm going to go set up a business exactly. on figueroa exactly like, that's not what happens um well i'm hoping uh yolanda that that this experience of having you know a grant these reimagined funds will at least um establish the opportunity for not that you're going to become you know the united negro college fund and have this right. giant infrastructure but at least a little bit more funding uh, and support from from outside resources. Absolutely, Dominique. I'm certainly hoping so, and I believe with this opportunity that you're providing sister friends and uh, councilman <clears throat> Marquis Harris Dawson to talk about the Reimagine Grant um, successes will will lead to that outcome. 
What else um, is coming? You know, this is a great example. What else do you see coming um, out of this that was that well, is meeting what you had hoped? Well, for? I, so that's a very good question, and thank you ask, for asking that. So fast forward now, we're t- we're three budget cycles later. We got a, a whole new council and a whole new mayor. Right. You know, so it's a whole different situation. And a whole new backlash. And a whole new backlash. Well, exactly right. Which is why I want to spend some time on the backlash this morning because it it is quite irritating to sit and watch in the council, uh, the, the the sort of backlash is a nice word for it. But what's happened now is you have a mayor who submitted the most progressive budget that the city's seen in generations, probably since the war on poverty. Which uh, is voted on today, right? Which is voted on today. We will finalize the budget this afternoon. So I'm going there. And so I've been sitting in the hearings. And I, I, I have to tell you, it's been quite infuriating mm. uh, because we have a $1.3 billion for homelessness, which is great. But the level of nitpicking and question asking is enraging. I mean, they want to know how much. I mean, now, outreach workers, right? People who go talk to homeless people. Right. Right. Now, mind you, most of the people around the table asking these questions wouldn't go near a homeless encampment without security. But let's just take that aside. Outreach workers. Well, why does the mayor have so many outreach workers? And how much do they make? And where is it getting paid for from? And how, you know, and and uh, why are there two instead of one? Why are there three instead of two? Just a ridiculous amount of inane nitpicking at the mayor and the mayor's budget. And it, you know, it feel, you know, for me, I'm, I will admit to being triggered, you know, as a black person because it, <laughs> it feels very much like the welfare. I'm triggered and I'm not even there. <laughs> right. It feels very much like the welfare compliance officer, right. making sure right. you know nobody gave you an extra box of cereal, right, uh, for your how for your children because if they did, we're going to take that five dollars away from your welfare check. I, I, I mean, it's just enraging. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think we're going to get the budget through. We have great advocates for unarmed response. We have great programming in unarmed response. Yeah, I want to um, talk more about that, too. Yeah. Uh, we got news, traffic, and sports right now. We're talking with Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. And thank you so much, Yolanda Washington. This is KBLA Talk 1580. She's reclaiming her time on KBLA Talk 1580. More First Things First with Dominic DePrima when we come forward. We hope you're having a good morning. I'm Mike Moore. Now, here's the latest from the Black Information Network. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will formally enter the 2024 presidential race next week. Reuters reporting DeSantis will likely file paperwork declaring his candidacy on May 25th to coincide with a donor meeting in Miami. DeSantis is considered the most serious challenger to former President Trump in the GOP race. In Michigan, the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office says ethnic intimidation charges have been filed against a 25-year-old Farmington Hills man for stabbing a black man after a road rage argument this week. Alexander Gojevich is also charged with assault and destruction of property. The incident started on the Lodge Freeway in Detroit with the suspect following the victim into Oakland County and slashing his tires. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Staples Print and Marketing Services help small business print big. Now get $15 off signs, banners, and posters when you spend $75 or more. Offer ends July 1st. Visit staples.com slash print big for details. This is your sign to try Staples where your prints are perfect guaranteed. Is this, the this is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. Lakers coach Darvin Ham is planning a lineup change for Game 2 against Denver. We'll have to wait until tip-off tonight to see what he does. Look for either 6'8 Jared Vanderbilt or 6'8 Rui Hachimura to be in the starting lineup. That means guards D'Angelo Russell or Dennis Schroeder, both starters in game one, will be coming off the bench. The Lakers were out-rebounded 22-6 in the first quarter. Twelve of those rebounds were pulled down by Nikola Jokic. The Lakers need to get a grip on their rebounding issues to avoid another fast start by the Nuggets. 5.30 tip-off on ESPN. Over in the East, the Miami Heat went into Boston and took game one. 35 points, seven assists, and six steals for Jimmy Butler. The Dodgers got a grand slam in the seventh inning from rookie outfielder James Outman to beat Minnesota. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America. 
The story of Emmett Till and his mother is a story of a family's promise and loss in a nation's reckoning with hate, violence, and abuse of power. It's a story that was seared into our memory and our conscience, the nation's conscience, when Mrs. Till insisted that an open casket for her murdered and maimed 14-year-old son. She said, let the people see what I've seen. The reason the world saw what she saw was because of another hero in this story, the black press. Jet Magazine, the Chicago Defender, and other black radio and newspapers were unflinching and brave in making sure America saw what she saw. Ida B. Wells once said, and I quote, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon the wrongs. Turning the light of truth upon the wrongs. We're unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk 1580, and we don't black down. Black down. The pandemic may be over, but many Angelinos could be at risk of losing the place they call home. It's important to know your rights as a residential renter in the city of LA. Did you know eviction protection still exists for unpaid COVID-19 rental debt that was due before March 31st, 2023? And that you have five days to respond to an eviction notice, also known as an unlawful detainer. Learn more about your rental rights at housing.lacity.org. Be informed, be protected, be at home. Something new is happening in California's public schools. They're called community schools. One of the foundations of community schools is shared decision making. Where parents and families, students and educators make decisions as one. Community schools lift the voices of folks that have traditionally been underserved. Many of our classes are designed around our own students' cultures, their background, their personal experiences. We bring culturally relevant curriculum to the classroom based on what their specific needs are. Improving student achievement and innovative classes like cybersecurity and gardening. And we assist families with their needs. Some schools have parent education programs, cooking and nutrition classes. Everything from medical or dental services to immigration law services. This is a one-stop shop that serves the needs of not just the students, but their families as well. They're California's community schools, reimagining public education. Paid for by the California Teachers Association. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Maisha Cairo here with a quick recap for my time at J.P. Morgan Chase's Advancing Black Wealth Tour. There were speakers Ian Dunlap, Damon John, Lynn Richardson, MC Light, Don Kennedy, to name a few. Take a listen to what Justin Grant, Community Development Lead at Chase's Advancing Black Pathway, let's see what he had to say. So I'm Justin Grant. I lead Community Development and National Partnerships for J.P. Morgan Chase's Advancing Black Pathway strategy. And so we're focused on strengthening the economic foundation of black communities, and we're making targeted investments in programs like the Advancing Black Wealth Tour to help us get our tools and resources out to the community to drive sustained impact over time. So when it comes to black and brown people, it sounds like Chase is making it their personal responsibility not only to facilitate these events, but to educate and provide resources. So Mr. Grant, I have to ask, what does wealth building look like for the individual? It's home ownership. It's having that freedom to be able to start your own business and create jobs in your community. And it's having that long-term plan towards retirement having that vision for what you want your life to be and you have the resources to actually live it. I'm Maisha Cairo. Thanks for sticking around. That was my recap from Chase's Advancing Black Wealth Tour. First stop was here in L.A. and they're taking it national. Thanks for waking up with Dominique DePrima on KBLA Talk 1580. My, my, my. We do have a lot to talk about. Councilmember Marquise Harris-Dawson is here. He is uh, over the 8th District of Los Angeles, where a lot of us live. And by us, I'm talking about black people at this moment. Uh, yours is the last majority black district, right? Yes, or, yeah. last majority black district. The, the uh, What's good for our folks is that the outlook is that it will stay majority black for at least a, a generation or so. A generation, okay, you guys got a generation yeah. by the block. <laughs> yes, you got time. Yeah, not obviously, if we all sell and move, we won't be black. Right, but that's why. I keep presuming it. the trends continue the way they've been going, we'll, we'll be in we'll be yeah. in good shape in this district. But after that, out of the fifteen council district seats, you, you shouldn't have any expectation where there will be enough black voters. What black voters will decide who the representative is mm. in, in the eighth? You can't win without black voters. Yeah, that's not true in any other district. Alrighty. 
now you know. Uh, so we were talking about this grant program, um, the what um, money that came out yeah. of reinvesting some dollars from the massive police budget into other aspects of community safety, which is really kind of the care first model that yes. voters have yes. been asking yes. for. Yes. And how some of these grants went to what we'll call micro organizations yes. that often don't get funding. We just spoke with Yolanda Washington from sisterfriends.org. Um, Yola, uh, Fran Jamat is on the phone. Yes. Uh, from the Jamat Rollins group. Good morning, Fran. Good morning. It's been good listening to you all. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, a uh, Fran worked with you. Fran, yes. Fran does philanthropy. Yes. <laughs> That's what I, uh, <laughs> been knowing Fran a long time. She is, doing Fran is the, or, Fran is the oracle of philanthropy. <laughs> the oracle, okay. <laughs> and, uh, it, and is the, uh, the truth teller. But, but really, we, we asked for, we reached out to Fran when we wanted to do this because, you know, I love the community and I love the work and I'm very committed to it. I was not prepared to go to jail behind it. Right. So we right. wanted to make sure everything was tight. Uh, and that we had a good grant program and that organizations could get the get these resources. One, I don't get in trouble. They don't get in trouble. You know, we, we create we create a positive story about their work, but also the ones that are ready. Knowing Fran makes the difference in how successful you can be in the philanthropic universe. Right. Uh, and so we the other outcome we wanted is that they know Fran and that they get very specific uh technical assistance to help those who are ready to move to move. So Fran, talk to me about what was different um, and, and, and important on this project compared to, because you have a, a big overview of what philanthropy looks like and, and why it seems like the usual suspects, not that those usual suspects are problematic, but why it's the same four, five, six groups that seem to get funding over and over again while a lot of other folks are working on car wash fundraiser dollars well you're so right and you've alluded to the the fact that the application process almost anywhere is daunting and off-putting and it makes it uh, worse when the people that you're applying to are strangers they have little understanding or knowledge of your organization your community what you're trying to do and i think it was very wise of councilman harris dawson to pair the prospective applicants with um, a resource where they don't have to come in and explain the landscape. They don't have to um, show up with um, data about all of the issues related to housing and homelessness and street trafficking, where that information is fairly well known. What is it that you want to do about it becomes the focus of the application, and how will you do it? And I think you're also alluding to um, it's not just the councilman's office that's concerned, that you, the city attorney, the city clerk, the city comptroller, mm. uh, mm -hmm. all, all have a look at these applications. And so... Um, sometimes I, I get to pay good cop, bad cop, and, and <laughs> I can be the bad cop and say, this is not going to pass muster. Mm -hmm. we, we need to tighten this up. Here, let us show you how budgets are done. Here, let us show you how, how to make objectives and outcomes that make sense. You, you say you're going to feed 1,500 people a day. Where is that going to happen? How are they? What are, are they lined up? What? Where is that going? You don't need to say fifteen hundred if the number is actually eighty-five. Right. Let's be real about yeah. what right. it is that's that, right. that you're right. doing. And those are eighty-five so, are you know verifiably fed, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, yeah. and 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 anybody can stand out there and count them. Right. You know, they line up and, and, and get their groceries. It's just, you know, you it, it, it's, it becomes about the details. And, and so well-intentioned people want to embellish um, the magnitude of the work because they think it's, it's important to show how, how that contributes. But it was the rea it's the reality of the work and the data that the council office needs to show how the issue is being addressed. And, and it's not easy to talk about how 
food security connects to public safety. Well, the other thing is a lot of people are being aspirational. Yes. They think they're going to feed mm-hmm. 1,500 people, right? When 85 show up, they say, next time we'll have 1,500. Right, and, and a lot of us <laughs> are used to operating on with small resources, so we just imagine that, oh, if I had more resources, I could do exponentially more. Yeah. And that yeah. may or may not be the case. Right, right. So, um, and, and so what's, you know, what's different about the outcomes or what, what do you find encouraging or um, instructional from what this process has, has yielded? So we have almost 60 uh, grant uh, recipients, organizations, and the large majority of them have never uh, received a grant before. They've done contract work, and, and even helping them understand the difference between a grant and a contract is is important. So with a contract, you know, you're paid, and sometimes not the full co- cost of the work, to do the work for the city or the county. Um, but with a grant, the grant comes to support the work that you do. And one of the the problems that many organizations face because they are on contracts is that the full cost of their work is not considered. Their phone bill, their electric bill, their uh, transportation costs, uh, storage. So general operating costs for these organizations is a huge part of what the funds will be used for, which allows them to work. Um, Sister Friends has an office. They have a staff. They, They have to keep phone lines open. They have to pay phone bills. So the grant can go to support both the general operating costs but also the specific project she costs of paying part of the salaries of those outreach workers that are out there on the street. So we help the organizations understand how to take a cost-effective approach to applying for and receiving and then using grant funds in a way that doesn't um, lead to failure because they end up getting evicted from their office because they couldn't pay the rent, but they were out doing <laughs> good work on the street. You know, it yeah. it, it, it is that, that uh, catch-22 where, where uh, so many uh, community-based organizations fall in a hole. Yeah, and I'm, I'm imagining a council member that's Again, disproportionately black organizations. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And it's, you know, the the talking about dealing with strangers, um, you know, we don't get the benefit of people saying, oh, there's a language barrier there, even though there is a language barrier. Yeah. We're all speaking English, but we ain't talking the same <laughs> language. Um, and so, and again, <laughs> the other thing is our communities are oftentimes in crisis. Yeah. And so the idea that I'm going to sit at a desk and talk to someone about paperwork for half a day when, you know, there's these children out on the street getting exploited is hard for a lot of groups. But, you know, we got to move to adjust to the system that we're in. I mean, I just I love this idea, um, council member, that, that Fran Jamont brought up. Sixty groups getting funded and a mm-hmm. huge number of those have never had a grant. Before. That's right. That's right. That's right. Certainly not a grant from the public sector. That that's a game. Certainly, I, I not would. A grant I feel like that would be a game changer. Yeah. Continue this conversation when we come forward. You know where you are. KBLA. It's home. It's talk fifteen eighty. A safe place to go loud. Loud. A great place for progressive politics. KBLA talk fifteen eighty. The Champion Counseling Center at Faithful Central Bible Church in collaboration with the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health and its Take Action LA initiative presents an amazing event just for the ladies in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month and it's absolutely free. Saturday, May 20th at the Cinemark Baldwin Hills. We'll kick things off with a movie screening of the Whitney Houston biopic, I Wanna Dance With Somebody at two o'clock p.m. After the movie, we'll dive into a meaningful panel discussion about the danger of the strong black woman. Ladies, we know you've been the rock for everyone around you, but it's time to recognize the toll that can take on your mind, body, and soul. This event is tailor-made for African-American women like you. Let us know you're coming. Visit faithfulcentral.com forward slash take action to register.
The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately 8 million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking, now start screening. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. Did you know addiction to drugs like meth or cocaine is a disease and not a choice? But getting help is. If you have stimulant use disorder, you, your family, and friends may have a lot of questions, including where to start. Choose Change California can help. Make a change today and find a proven treatment option for you at choosechangeca.org. Come join us for a celebration of community, culture, and healing at the I Love Myself Festival, Sunday, May 21st from 11 a.m. until 4 p.m. at the outdoor pavilion of the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall. Yoga, meditation, food, vendors, a kid zone, and a special panelist segment featuring Samantha Smith, D. Smoke, and Ebony Davis. Performances by Wilson, Skylar Ray, Divas of Compton, Iman Europe, Kalan For Real For Real, and Eric Bellinger. It's all going down. Down Sunday, May 21st at the Outdoor Pavilion of the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Let's come together for a day of fun, celebration, and healing. For more details, contact Project Pit on social media or text 323-448-5770. The I Love Myself Festival in celebration of Mental Health Awareness Month is a free event for community healing and culture. May 21st from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall. This is KBLA Talk 1580, where hate loses and love wins. Council member Marquise Harris Dawson is our guest. If you're in the 8th District, he is your representative. Um, and we've been talking about, the, you know, the grant program mm-hmm. that came out of yeah. some budget realignment. And we're in budget se- system uh, season, excuse mm-hmm. me, right now. Actually, today is the budget vote. One of the things you've been working on is unarmed response yes. to certain kinds of yes. situations. Yes. Where are we with that? So uh, we're very excited. This year's budget has more resources in it, uh, more staff positions for an unarmed response than we've ever had in the history of the city. Um, that Whether those are the therapeutic vans, uh, which I helped author a motion three years ago. A therapeutic van is when somebody calls, and we all see this, someone's having an episode. Sometimes the person's in our family, sometimes they're in our block, sometimes they're just on a street corner. Everybody can see they have an episode. None of us want to call the police because the police are going to come with blaring lights and guns. and Right, and the person could die. Right. The person could easily be killed or, more likely, the person will just be frightened, as any of us would. if right. somebody And you're frightened in the middle of an episode. Who knows what happens? Therapeutic van puts a clinical psychologist on the van to go out and deal with the person with the ability to hospitalize the person if they need that. If they qualify for, mm-hmm. you know, if, if, to be hospitalized either against their will or if they give consent to be hospitalized. In either case, the folks on the van can do that. A lot of times what you'll find and in, in, in listening to the stories are amazing. They will sit a person down who's, you know, um, you know, exhibiting sort of angry or or um, uh, yelling at people or just being disruptive in one, one, one way. And what you'll find is. After they examine the person, it's like, oh, this person has an ingrown toenail. Wow. Something so is hurting them. Yeah. So they're in pain, right. right? And they're reacting to their pain. But, you know, because they're having a mental health challenge, they don't necessarily make the connection. Wow. That's wild. So they yeah. don't choke them out and then kill yeah, them. Yeah, like, exactly. Like so the New person York doesn't subway. get killed. They get right. dealt with. And, and in that right. situation, that person is actually well enough where they don't need to be hospitalized. Right. But they also uh, can't just be out on the street without any assistance. And so we're able to deliver that, provide safety. Because if you're a shop owner, you know, you own a candle shop or, or you know, a, a, a any type of small business, you can't have a person like that in front of your doorstep because, you know, it makes people not want to go to your business. So that business owner is helped, that individual is helped, and the community is helped. Right. So those dollars, I mean, of course, there's been criticism that, you know, the, that the police still are eating up too much of the budget. Yeah. Yeah. We, look, we're still way too dependent on coercion and the threat of violence as a way of dealing with problems. I, I, I'm I'm unabashedly sure about that. Uh, we deal with everything from, you know, if a business has too many posters 
on their window, more posters on their window than the law allows. We send a guy with a gun. It makes no sense. It is part and parcel of the this country's problem with guns, frankly. I mean, and also that seems more expensive. That guy with the gun has, you know, got a big salary and benefits. Yep. Whereas, uh, say, outreach worker? Yeah. I mean, an outreach <laughs> worker has a far lower salary. Not and that I, they I, should. I mean, right. eventually I they'll have higher salaries and benefits, as, too. Well, but, once would they're allowed to show their worth, show right. what, what it's what worth. They can do. What they, they can, can definitely the get the posters look, off the look, window. Th- this, and, and I think you were in this discussion where Dr. Philip Atiba Goff put it, very succinctly why do you send a person who has the option of execution yeah i mean it, like that that just shouldn't be on our streets uh with the pervasiveness that it is yeah marquise harris dawson is our guest time flies when you're on the radio um when we come forward i want to you know hand you the mic um and and, and you know let us know what you want us to know about this going on in the eighth well, um, you know, look, we're excited uh, about Destination mm-hmm. Control. Right now we're in budget mode, so I'm everybody, you know, call in, talk up, you know, go online, get in that, get in the Twitterverse uh, with folks and mix it up around the budget. I think we're going to get this budget through, and I think it's going to be the most progressive budget we have. But it hasn't been easy, and, and a lot of the old tendencies that we thought, you know, sort of died with Ronald Reagan and George Bush and all those people are creeping back up, and so I'm Ooh. very, very concerned. Yeah, how we fight that when mm-hmm. we come forward on KBLA mm-hmm. Talk 1580. The station you turn to when you've had it up to here with cultural incompetence. KBLA Talk 1580. Some people won't give you the real talk on drugs, but it's time we know the facts. Fentanyl is killing people. It's a powerful opioid, often made illegally and commonly mixed with illicit drugs. It can even be pressed into counterfeit pills that resemble prescription medications. Just two milligrams, about the size of a few grains of sand, can potentially be lethal. This isn't an ad to scare you, but it is an ad to make you think twice. Get the facts. Go to realdealonfentanyl.com. This message is brought to you by the Ad Council. You are 71's backed up. What's your 20? Over. Olivia needs more drivers for her trucking company to go the extra mile. Three more stops to make. She wants to hitch a team to drive business forward. Lots of double nickels on the 169. You know what? I'm over this driver shortage. Indeed can help her hire great people fast. I need Indeed. Indeed you do. We instantly connect you with quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job description. Visit Indeed.com slash credit and get $75 towards your first sponsored job. Terms and conditions apply. Mom's early Alzheimer's diagnosis was hard to take. And when I left the oven on, we decided together that it was time to see a doctor and make a plan. Early detection gave us more time to seek out information and support as a family. If you or your family are noticing changes, it could be Alzheimer's. Talk about seeing a doctor together. For more information, visit alz.org slash time to talk. A message from the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. Find a righteous range and don't be afraid to say what you see. We're KBLA Talk 1580. I'm Dominique DePrima here with Council Member Mark Ridley. Oh, Mark Ridley. Oh Tom. Good morning. Carrie Brain is going to get you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Harris Dawson. Yes. I'm sorry, Carrie. Okay, let's start that again. Re- do over. Wow, brain fade. Okay. Uh, no, it's not uh, Mark Ridley Thomas, although I've interviewed him many times. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good morning. I'm Dominique Dupree, and I'm here with CD8 council member Marquise Harris Dawson and uh, his wife listening, yes. <laughs> Carrie <laughs> Harris Dawson. <laughs> Tell me about how we mix it up with the budget. How do we make a difference with the budget? Well, I think there's a few ways. I mean, I think the main thing is is an expression of public opinion that's loud and resolute and, you know, reminding the council that we voted for a mayor. And we want the mayor to lead. Um, And that if we care about the things that she's been able to accomplish in the short time, that we let people know. So that means on social media, especially Twitter, I cannot tell you how much Twitter impacts council members. None of us will admit it in public, (laughs) but all of us have a little thing that gives us a ding every time our name is used in a tweet. Interesting. And and what so, you know, tagging council members makes a big difference. Tagging the mayor uh, makes a big, big difference as well. Calling in, uh, writing in, writing into the Times, all of that. Again, I, I know far less people read the LA Times than, than have in the past, but what's important is the people inside that building read it. Yeah, it's still and, the yeah, paper of record. It's still the paper of record, and it's still the record that people go to. I, I mean, I'm a council member. I read the Times every morning without fail. Um, and so getting our voices into those spaces makes a big difference because 
a lot of times people don't understand how what they're doing is landing in the community yeah and 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 how it sounds um and it's not always the best use of our position as their colleagues to point out, hey, like this is what you're doing. Right. And so I think that that's important. I've heard it all over the community how upset people are about how the mayor's being treated yep. uh, by the council. And, and I, t- I totally understand and I totally agree. And I think we got to be loud and proud about it. But again, I think the most important thing, and this is, this is vintage Karen Bass, there's the chatter. She's going to prevail. Right. You could and, spend I mean, $100 million and she'll still prevail. I mean, th- hello. <laughs> and thank goodness she's, you know, who she is because mm-hmm. she is a uniter. She's mm-hmm. a real leader. You know, I would be up there losing it, but she's yeah. doing a great job. And I do think, you know, it, it, it's, it sounds like it's like in the old days of TV, one letter or one email, people count that as maybe 10 or 20 exactly. constituents. Exactly. Especially if it's not a form letter. So some right. groups send me, you know, like the environmental groups, will say, you know, save this donkey or whale or something. And, you know, it's the same. Everything says the same thing. But if it says this is who I am, this is where I live. I heard this the other day. This is how I felt about it. That. Yeah. Go that counts as two hundred letters because it's a genuine because it's genuine and, it's real and it's unduplicated and most of us think about that and don't do it yeah so right that, exactly so but it's just take the file especially now all you do is take out your phone da, 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 at whoever you want to at and send it and you're done yeah you're done good stuff um got a minute here <laughs> council <laughs> member Marquise Harris it's the three names yes MHD <laughs> what do you want to leave us with well you know what I want to leave you with is that this is an incredibly hopeful time I think we're actually turning the the page on safety I think we're actually moving into a space where we have a care first model where our interventions the government interventions are really about helping people rather than punishing people uh, and for so long we've lived in a punishment society and of course black folks bear the ban- brunt of that Whenever, it, whether people intend it or don't intend it, it really doesn't matter. The impacts are on us. So as we move away from a punishment society, it makes things better for us, but it also makes a better society. And it makes a place mm. where folks can actually contribute because when they have a problem or they have a challenge or they're facing trauma, they aren't punished because of it. They're helped because of it. And it frees them up to do more and it frees all of us up to live together. And if you want to find uh, the council member on Twitter, it's MHDCD8. That's right. On Twitter yeah. and on Instagram. That's right. Yeah. All of them. All, all the places, <laughs> yes, all the all things. Of the thing, all the, the talkings. <laughs> <laughs> we're, at, and we're at KVLA 1580, by the way. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Member. It's always good to be here. It's KVLA Talk 1580. KVLA 1580 Santa Monica. We hope you're having a good morning. I'm Mike Moore. Now, here's the latest from the Black Information Network. Florida 